Dr. Zachary Moore, thank you very much indeed for coming on Skype for Talk Beliefs all the way from Dallas, Texas. Uh, before we talk about one of my favorite topics, which is evolution, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, so I actually have a, a PhD in molecular biology, uh, which is why I, I kind of go by the, the Dr. Zach moniker. It, um, professionally, when I'm in professional circles, uh, I'm Dr. Moore, but this is a little bit more of a you know personal hobby-ish crusade, you might say. Um, so I didn't exactly want to come off like that. And yet, uh, I still ended up with uh, a website that I wanted to use, uh, and I chose drzack.net because it was very short. And so I sort of go by Dr. Zach. So a lot of the people that know me as the host of the Evolution 101 podcast uh, know me as Dr. Zach. And so that's sort of how I came into this whole thing. And I have to give full credit, of course, uh, to Reggie Finley, the erstwhile um, host of the uh, Atheist Internet uh, radio show, the Internet Infidel Show, um, who really sort of gave me the idea for the Evolution 101 podcast in the first place. Um, he wanted to have some, some sort of a regular discussion about evolution. He was reaching out to a couple of people that he knew, uh, one of them being uh, Dr. Massimo Pigliucci, who has uh, a PhD. He has two PhDs, actually, one in philosophy, one in um, evolutionary biology. Uh, so I had offered to do some, uh, some stuff with him, and uh, then I thought, well, you know, I could, I could do this on my own as well. And so I, I started doing Evolution 101 podcasts, oh, gosh, over 10 years ago now, and just created a series of them. I, 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 I kind of got to a point where I, I sort of naturally finished what I could reasonably speak about and, and keep it basic for people. Yeah. Um, so I sort of left it there. And it was really just a, a kind of a freshman effort, I would say. Um, and I've been surprised, quite frankly, that nobody else since then has tried to do anything similar. And so Evolution 101, which is still out there on iTunes, you can find it, uh, still really is the only evolution podcast. It really is. I've looked. Yeah. <laughs> I've looked, too. And I was, I mean, you know, I, it was the, my very first thing that I'd ever done. Um, the equipment I had was terrible. I really had no idea what I was doing. Um, and yet... It, it still is out there, and it's been downloaded well over a million times, uh, and I still get uh, emails uh, from people such as yourself, uh, you know, sort of wanting to follow up and, and catch up on that, so. Oh, great. Well, Zach, you live in Texas where there's a very high concentration, I guess you could say, of evangelical Christians who are creationists, even young earth creationists, who cling mm. to this belief that the earth is only 6,000 years old. So what do you think? scares them so much about the idea of evolution being true well uh so i live in texas now which does have, as you noted does have a lot of evangelical christians here and so being uh being an atheist in texas is a bit like being an evangelical in the uk i would say that they're, they're kind of similar opposite sides of the coin um <laughs> We do have um, the Institute for Creation Research moved here to, to Dallas, Texas uh, several years ago. It used to be on the West Coast. Now it's here. It's literally in my backyard, and I've been able to, to chat with some of the people there occasionally. Of course, you know, not all of those are young Earth. Some of those are old Earth. Um, but I grew up in, believe it or not, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, which is right across the river from Ken Ham. Oh. And his uh, creation... Um, the Creation Evidence Museum, and now he has something called the Ark Encounter, uh, okay. which he put together with uh, some, you know, gray area funding from the local municipality, uh, which turns out to be uh, potentially kind of a boondoggle for them. We'll see. I, you know, it, the the reports I've heard it's suggest not doing, that, it's not doing as well as they were hoping. Is it? Suggest that it's not doing very well. Yeah. Uh, that being said. Uh, I have visited, I have not visited the Ark. Uh, I have visited the Creation Museum. Mm. And, can, it, and it's a fantastic museum of creationism, right? So it's, it's a terrible science museum. It's not in, all, in any sense a science museum. And uh, my, one of my cousins used to work at the Natural History Museum in Cincinnati. And he took it, you know, when the Creation Museum was being built, he took that very personally. And he, you know, it was just, this is not a museum. This is horrible. This is an affront to everything that we, we try to do, you know, education-wise. And I went there after it opened, and I said, you know, this is, I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful, I mean, the production value is, is uh, without a doubt, it matches any sort of museum that you would find pretty much anywhere. Um the one caveat being, as I mentioned already, 
it is not really a science museum. It is a museum about creationism. So it does a beautiful job of telling the story of creationism. Yes. And, and why creationists believe why they do. And Ken Ham goes out of his way to underline this. He has signs put up all over the museum that basically uh, present a dichotomy. Either you trust man or you trust God. And if and God says creation happened, so if you deny that, then you are not trusting God. You are trusting man over God. And that's it. The, that presentation makes it as simple and as clear as it could possibly be made. The, the argument from creationism is, and from creationists like Ken Ham, is if you don't accept creationism, then you have to throw out your Bible. And mm -hmm. now, granted, there's lots of Christians that don't agree with him, but that is the fundamental aspect of his argument. And there are many Christians for whom that argument does resonate, and so they feel like... I can't really accept anything else than what God tells me. If I, I feel like I'm betraying God, I'm betraying my faith. Um, some creationists might sort of pull back a little bit and say, well, you know, when you, when you look at all this stuff, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of confronted by, on the one hand, this, this argument that people like Ken Ham make, and on the other hand, you know, they, they look at everything that science has done for them in their lives. So, you know, they're playing with their iPhones or getting on jet airplanes, you know, then they're able to connect to people over the Internet. And none of this it has anything to do with uh, the faith, right? So Christianity has not put these things into place. Uh, science has put these things into place. And science uh, has, has, when it examines the history of, of biology, the history of life, tells us that evolution is the case. So they're confronted with these two very contradicting points of view. And so very often what I run into is creationists um, who are, uh, they, they aspire to be creationists, like they, that, that argument does hold force with them, but they at the same time they can't completely assent to that well, you know, 6,000 years ago, etc. So what they do is they just say, well, look, I don't know. And they just sort of retreat into um, creationistic agnosticism. They they just they don't want to um, they don't want to piss off Ken Ham and, and fall into the force of that argument. But they also don't want to deny um, how successful and reliable science is. It sounds like a bit of cognitive dissonance that are they're allowing into their own lives. It, it absolutely is. And I'll, I'll tell you another story. Uh, there's a, a good friend of mine who uh, oh, several years back he was a, uh, a a youth pastor here at a church in in the Dallas area. And, uh, and I was hanging around with him, and we were doing stuff together and, you know, having a great time. There were a lot of things that we had in common. And he invited me over to his house one time uh, when he had some people from his youth group there. And uh, he introduced me to this, this girl, high, high school age. I think she may have been a senior, you know, last, last, last term or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and he said, you know, you might be interested in talking to her because she's been studying evolution. And she's been telling me about it and how cool she thinks it is. And I said, oh, really? Well, that's, that's fantastic. And I sat down with her, and we just sort of chatted a bit, because I was floored, number one, that they were teaching evolution at all in Texas. Yes. <laughs> which which I, I will say, I will point out, um, there is a bit of a misconception. Uh, in Texas, the, uh, the, the state puts together these standards for how certain subjects are to be taught, right? It, was, it happens in all the states in, in the United States. Uh, and the Texas state standards are are reviewed and uh, and contributed to by by experts in the field right. uh, now there are certain points in which the Texas standards uh, engender a lot of controversy and for very good reasons that being said when taken overall the biology standards with regard to evolution are actually quite good hmm. the the um, the, the caveat there is that uh, the sort of uh, creationist interests or the intelligent design interests, the, the various people that are able to uh, manipulate that process on the political side of things, um, provide a lot of loopholes for yeah. teachers to teach alternative things. So, but the, but the standards themselves are quite good. It's just that um, they're a bit um, civvy, 
perhaps you know they 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 allow for other things to come in but but so anyway so this girl was telling me that in her class she had learned all about evolution was explaining it to me and it was all it all made sense to her she said well yeah obviously i mean you just look at this and and uh, you see how the, the different species stack up. You look at the fossil record. Yeah. You know, it seems, you know, obvious. And I said, well, that's fantastic. That's really great. So you don't even have a problem with, for example, with humans being um, uh, sharing ancestry with other primates. And she said, oh, no. No, no, no. I, I, I don't accept that at all. And I, 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 it took me back. And I said, well, <laughs> wait a minute. We've just been chatting about how... You know, all the fossil evidence lines up and the molecular evidence and, you know, com comparative homology and all this stuff. And it all makes very good sense to you until we start talking about humans and, and other primates sharing common ancestry. And she said, well, but, but, but humans are specially created in the image of God. Mm. And I said, okay, that's fine. For, you know, that, that you believe that is fine. And, and there's, there's nothing that I can say to dissuade you from that. And there's nothing that I would want to say to dissuade you from that. As long as you realize that what you're saying now is a, uh, a religious viewpoint. It is not a scientific viewpoint. This is not a conclusion that you have come to based on uh, the work of science or any sort of research. It, it, as long as you realize that what you're saying and, and the way that you're concluding on that point is purely religious... I'm fine. I mean, then what else can I say? You know, I'm, I'm not going to have a religious argument with you about the Imago Dei. Um, but as long as you realize that that's not science, that's fine. So it seems to be how they feel about themselves that matters more than anything else. Yes. And it, there's some compartmentalization that goes along there, too. Uh, and, and increasingly, I think, within the uh, American church, uh, creationism is uh, becoming increasingly uh, marginalized. Even intelligent design, I would say, is increasingly marginalized. And the intelligent designers, um, uh, particularly the Discovery Institute here, um, oh, yeah. are feeling particularly uh, embattled. In fact, I went to, just a, about a month ago, I went to a conference that was sponsored by the Discovery Institute at a uh, seminary, a Southern Baptist Seminary here in Fort Worth. Yeah. And, the, um, and uh, Dr. John West gave a talk, and I've got the brochure from that here, and you can see... Let's see, this is this is the brochure that went along with his talk. Darwin's corrosive idea. Uh, yeah, right. And and you see what's being corroded there. It's a church. The church is falling apart. And the 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 entire uh, content of his talk was about how evolution is now breaking into uh, the church, and believers are now uh, embracing evolution. Um, to a much greater degree than ever before, and having really nothing to do with, uh, cer certainly nothing to do with creationism, except in small sort of, you know, regressive fundamentalist pockets, but even not really that interested in intelligent design. So they're fighting defensive battle for the church. I mean, we're not even talking about the wider culture. We're talking about the church itself. Intelligent design is, is fighting a defensive battle. Um, and that's in large part due, and I have to yeah. give full credit to this. This is in large part due to uh, Christian evolutionists, you know, Christian scientists, I should say, uh, Christian scientists who affirm evolution, such as Francis Collins, you know, who's been a huge force for that. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't agree with his evangelicalism, but you know, so what? He's a fantastic scientist. He um, he was a good good friends with Christopher Hitchens, you know, and he's ever. I've never met the guy personally, but every report I've heard is sounds that like he's just a great guy. And one of the things that he has taken upon himself is he wants to um, make Christians more comfortable with the idea of evolution because there's nothing wrong with it, and there's nothing in evolution that contradicts uh, Christianity per se. It only contradicts a specific literal interpretation of Genesis one, two, three. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that they will, if they're not already, I'm sure that they will fit it into their apologetics somehow, whether they say that the the, seven, or the six days of creation were six million years, or which fits in with the, the divergence between apes and humans. So who knows? Who knows what they're working on? Well, it's entirely possible um, within uh, 10, 20 years that apologists, that, that creations will be completely gone and apologists will be using evolution uh, as a way of arguing for the existence of God, they're already doing that in the realm. Of, well, they're already doing that in the realm of astrophysics. So they're um, the the Cosmos series. 
uh, that was sort of reinvigorated by Neil deGrasse Tyson recently got a lot, you know, because it was shown in the United States on uh, on the Fox Channel, which is a very popular uh, channel. Uh, typically shows you know stupid cartoons and the like, reality shows. But uh, but Seth MacFarlane got it um, got it on Fox, and so it, it, it invigorated this this interest in astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology, all that stuff. And, and now I see apologists trying to take advantage of that and use that to make arguments in support of God, um, you basically using the cosmological argument for God. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I'm, I would not at all be surprised if in 10, maybe 20 years, that uh, evolutionary theory starts being used in the same way as a, an argument for God. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I wouldn't be surprised either, actually, because they have to use what's there, and if it's if they can't deny it, they're going to have to incorporate it. Yeah, very true. Um, yeah, Zach, um, there are so many misconceptions and misunderstandings when it comes to the theory of evolution. Least of which is that it is it isn't just a theory. Um, mm -hmm. Could you go over some of the most common misconceptions and basically why they're wrong? So the, the biggest misconception uh, altogether is that evolution has within it a sense of teleology, that there is some, uh, some underlying purpose that evolution has. Like the, the idea that there was some goal in mind uh, as species evolved. Yeah. Most, typically, most typically, the way people think about it is that we are the end goal of evolution. Right, so all these things that that, that took place in the, in the billions of years, millions of years, tons of thousands of years prior to us, was all leading up to us, and this is absolutely a mistake, right? So this is this is it's a philo it's a philosophical position, and it may not be wrong, um, but it does not derive from evolutionary theory itself. Evolutionary theory merely describes how things happened, um, and if there was some teleology, and this is this is sort of where um, as I was mentioning before, as the the uh, theistic evolutionists, such as Francis Collins, this is where they make their hay. They uh, they layer over uh, evolutionary theory with teleology, um, but that the, the teleology comes from their Christian perspective. It does not come from the science. The, the science is devoid from that. And so the biggest misconception that a lot of people have, even secular people think that you know evolution is a process leading up to a specific type of thing, and you know. One of the things, one of the questions I, I got asked a lot when I was doing the Evolution 101 podcast is, um, what are we evolving into? <laughs> like, like there's a process, like it's uh, uh, like, we're, like we're Pokemon or something like that. You know, we have this form and then this form and then this form and then our ultimate form. Yeah. We'll know when we get there, but the, right. the, there is no there, is there? It just keeps happening or... Right, and 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 the the next dominant species on this planet might not be, even be us, right? So it may... Yeah. Uh, if, if if something were to happen to us, if we were let the you know the, the greenhouse effect run away with itself, maybe, or or we left the planet for some other reason, um, you know, the, the, it could be any number of species. Most likely, a rodent. Uh, you know, they're they're very uh, adaptable and capable of survival. Um, so there's not there's not a path, and this so this misconception that there is a certain path to evolution. Um, I, uh, you find this not just with religious believers who are trying to sort of compare because it's their, their natural way of thinking about things. Well, you know, how would you get from molecules to man? Like, you know, if you sat down and tried, you know, this is a very common objection. You know, how do you evolve from molecules to man? Well, you're not evolving from molecules to man. Like you don't sit down with, uh, you know, amino acids and fit, think about, well, how do I get this to turn into a human being? Right. That, that's not the process at all. It, it sort of goes where it goes. It branches in, in all these different directions, right? So it's not even really a tree. You know, the, the way that the evolutionary trees have been drawn are kind of deceptive in themselves because it, it appears like, you know, we have this, this root that grows up and, and we're at the top. But that's not really the case. We're, you know, we're, we're on, a, on, a, um, on a tiny little branch of a branch of a branch of a branch that's sort of off to the side. Like, we're not even... Evolutionary speaking, we're not even that important. It's we're getting important. bushier and bushier, isn't it? That's, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's natural to see why this will happen. We are important to us. You know, human, human beings 
are nothing if not egotistical. You know, we want we want the world to revolve around us. We want the sun to revolve around the earth because naturally, you know, why wouldn't it? You know, we're the most important thing that exists. We we are uh, the the pinnacle of God's creation. We were created on the sixth day, right? So that that creationism is a natural theological process, and it, it resonates with us because it feeds our own egos. Uh, but science does not feed our own egos. Uh, creationists will accept evolution over an observable time, which is microevolution, but they don't seem to want to accept macroevolution, uh, which is, of course, over many years, even millions of years. So what's the best way to show somebody that macroevolution has happened and is happening? So the, <laughs> this is a tough one, too, because... Um, the, the difference between micro and macro evolution has nothing to do with, with the actual process. It has everything to do with scale, right? So usually what I say um, to creationists who are, who are questioning this, and they say, well, you know, I'll accept micro evolution, of course, but not macro evolution. I'll say to them, look, when you go down to the, to the store um, to buy a loaf of bread at, you know, Sainsbury's or whatever, you buy a loaf of bread, you hand over your money, you get the bread, you know, and it makes sense to you that the money that ends up in their till at the end of the day makes a difference to their count, you know, however much money that they brought in at the end of the day. That's fine. That, those microeconomics, right? Yeah. But does it also make sense to you that shopping at certain stores versus other stores makes a difference in the entire corporation's performance? performance year after year after year and will change the way that the, the company um, sort of realigns itself or makes big decisions, maybe even decides to, to split off stores, close stores, uh, merge with other companies. Do you understand that you're buying a loaf of bread there makes a difference at that level too? And they'll say, well, yeah, I mean, of course it does because what else would do that, right? It's not some, it's not some magically, mystically um, process at that high level, at the level of the corporation that's completely divorced from, you know, me buying a loaf of bread. And I said, well, that's exactly the same thing, right? So the difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics is just a difference in scale. It's the same process that's happening, right? It's still a cum accumulation of every individual's in, you know, individual purchasing pattern. So the same thing is true at the evolutionary level. The, the changes that are made at the micro level, which we would say, you know, uh, within a population over, you know, a relatively short amount of time, there's nothing, there's no difference in that between that and macro uh, evolution. Now, I've run into, in fact, I had a conversation with um, uh, an intelligent design proponent who, uh, was was talking about speciation and uh, and I was asking him you know so he didn't he didn't think that uh, that there was any argument to be made for a common ancestry between any species whatsoever he thought all the different species uh, had their own individual um, sort of uh, selective path like he wasn't exactly denying natural selection but he was saying you know, that, that might happen, you know, within the species, but all the species are not related to each other. And I said, well, where did they all come from? How do we get all these species then? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and he he basically uh, said, well, I think that each, every single species that we know of today um, ha was was at its root was some abiogenic genetical process. Hmm. So this, you know, like, like, we, when we think of abiogenesis, right, we're thinking of the, the origin of life. Um, when scientists think about this anyway, we think about uh, a cell. Like at some at some point, there were um, there were there were membranes that were forming naturally, or uh, certain enzymes that were rep replicating themselves naturally for whatever reason because of their structure or the uh, the environment that they they had enough energy in the in the mix, etc. That at some point there was a, a cell that was able to, to survive and replicate itself as well, and that was abiogenesis. So this person was saying, well, that sort of thing happened, but it happened for giraffes, it happened for donkeys, it happened for banana trees, it happened for humans. So to me, that's, you know, I was sort of done with the conversation at that point. It's, it's just so uh, un 
believable to me that you could have every single one of the species, you know, billions of species of, of animals that have existed over the entire course of uh, yeah. the, the planet. Um, that we would have abiogenesis for every single species that would result in a situation where, of course, if you look at their uh, genetic makeup, you look at the molecular evidence, it looks like they all uh, share common ancestry. But you have separate abiogenetical uh, events that take place that just so happen to occur in a pattern that is identical to one that you would expect to see if they were. Um, if go. they did have come so you know, at that point, I'm sort of done. There's, there's not much more I can say. <laughs> okay, uh, Zach, in your uh, evolution 101 podcast, you've addressed the objections to the molecular evidence of evolution. So, in layman's terms, what are these evidences, and how do creationists try to refute them? Well, that's that's one way. Um, it, is, is to say, well, you know, there was uh, there was separate uh, abiogenetical events that happened, and it's just it's just a coincidence that these evidences line up to suggest common ancestry. Uh, but but just in a nutshell, what what are the evidences? Well, there's two categories. Uh, there's the evidence within the uh, the coding regions of our genomes, not just humans, but but you know all life. There's the um, the coding region, and then there's other evidences within the non-coding region. Uh, this is not to say that it's necessarily the the junk. Um, you know, junk DNA is was originally thought of as the just the non-coding stuff, the stuff that didn't actually code for genes that were expressed. Uh, we know now that there is, of course, you know, very important regulatory elements in the non-coding region. It, it still means that most of it probably is junk, but there is there's some uh, there's some uh, gems in in the midst of that as well. But so it's, it's basically the coding region and the non-coding region. And within the coding region itself, uh, the main evidence is that uh, there's significant sequential redundancy, both at the level of the DNA and also at the level of the amino acid sequence, because there's 64, there's there's uh, there's four different nucleotides possible. And they're read in codons of three nucleotides each, which means that we have 64 possible codons that exist. But there's less than half of the of that number is actual amino acids. So that means that there's a lot of different uh, codons that code for the same amino acids, which means that if you want to write a chain of amino acids, you can write it lots of different ways using DNA. You can get the exact same amino acid sequence. The amino acid sequence, of course, results in the proteins, which are the functional molecules of all life. So there's no reason why you would expect that uh, two different organisms, even if they wanted to have the same, if you were designing this, right? If you're, if you're not using an evolutionary process, if, you, if, it's, if it's undesigned, that's one thing. But if it's designed and you can do whatever you want, like you're a genetic engineer, um, as you know, some intelligent designers sort of imagine that uh, that God or the, the designer is, um, if you were doing that, then you could create the exact same protein in every different species and use a completely different DNA sequence. And yet, that's not what we see. We see uh, sort of iterative differences, uh, the, and the further away the, the species appear to be using uh, hom you know, homology, basically homology analysis, the further away that they would appear to be, the further away, for the most part, the further away the molecular sequences uh, seem to be. But not to the extent at which uh, you would expect every single species could have a separate sequence, right? So what we see in that evidence is exactly what we would expect to see if there was some sort of an iterative evolutionary process with common ancestry. Right. Now, for the non-coding region, real quick, we see lots of other things that match up that also fall into that same pattern. We see uh, 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 transposon elements, we see pseudogene elements, and we see uh, endogenous retroviruses that also associate and are found within the genomes of all species in a pattern that suggests common ancestry that you would not expect to find if you if every species was created by itself by some sort of a supernatural uh, genetic manipulator uh, who had all the, all these resources at his or her disposal. It's doubtful that the creationist scientists, I use that word loosely, uh, look into things like. Uh, uh, the molecular evidence for evolution. I mean, that, that doesn't happen, does it, basically? 
Uh, so the there are a couple. There's uh, there's a molecular bi- biologist uh, by the name of Douglas Axe, uh, and there is uh, I think a, is a microbiologist by the name of Scott Minich. Uh, but they are focused on most of their research. Well, I should say I think all of their research now that they've joined the Discovery Institute uh, focuses on. Uh, trying to discover the limits of what evolution can do. So they're, they're, they're making the argument that it's not possible to evolve a certain set of changes in a protein to affect some sort of functional difference. So they're, they're following the same argument that, that creationists have made over the, over the years. Evolution can't do X. You know? And so they're, if, if evolution can't do X, then we throw the whole thing out and we replace it with intelligent design. But, but, of course, that doesn't follow. But, but that's, that's the argument that they pursue. They, they do like to basically just refute everything. That seems to be that they're, they're, their whole if you, game. Exactly. If you can refute some part of evolution, then we get to throw the whole thing out and replace it with intelligent design, and everyone goes back to church. Because, as we see from you know, the, the stuff that they put out, that is the thing that they're most concerned with. They're most concerned that people are leaving church. They, they, they don't really care about evolution Per se, just they don't think that it's a bad science necessarily. They think it's harmful to uh, the nation's spiritual faith. In fact, this this event that I went to, one of the Discovery Institute fellows, um, in discussion with some of the, it was mostly Christian students that were there. Um, he just underlined it perfectly. He said, you know, the problem is naturalism. Naturalism is a disease, and we need to stomp it out. Hmm. Well. Hey, you know that's that's fine that you think that, uh, but that's a philosophical position. Uh, that's not a scientific position. And so what they're doing is they're advancing this philosophical position, and under the guise of it being science, and it's not. And and it's very easy to see that they're doing that. Oh. And of course, at the moment, uh, America is under a new government, and there are plenty of science deniers right now. Uh, People in power and the White House. At the White House, is quite a few people who want to see evolution taken out of the school curriculum altogether. Um, one way to get through to people like this, maybe to tell them how the study of evolution affects them in their everyday life right now, wouldn't you say? Well, one would hope. Uh, I will say this with regard to uh, American politics at the federal level at this point. There, I, I really have no way of predicting uh, what's going to happen. As currently, Francis Collins is still the head of the NIH, so I'm hopeful that he'll be able to remain there and and he will do good work, and I, I, I trust him. Um, in general, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, if you can point out to people how uh, understanding evolution helps us uh, in our own lives. Uh, and one easy way of doing that is to, to talk a little bit about infectious disease, right? So if you talk about uh, the big problem that we have in this country with antibiotic resistance, um, that is in itself, that is a uh, sort of a pure expression of evolution, right? So you have all these bacteria and, and other things um, that are sort of floating around in the epidemiological uh, makeup of this country. And we've developed a pretty good uh, armamentarium of antibiotics, um, but we haven't been using them in a very systematic way. Or we've, we are now, we're, we're starting to develop those systems to do that. Uh, but historically, we have not. And so we've uh, basically been applying selective pressure to these, uh, to these microbes, and they're coming back at us with resistance to the drugs that we've been using. So that's a particularly uh, scary yeah quite frankly, problem, uh, and understanding the evolution and, and of these uh, microbes and, and how to sort of work around that, how to design uh, newer drugs that can anticipate that evolutionary process could be the difference between life and death. Zach Moore, thank you very much for talking to us. And uh, anyone who wants to follow your work or follow you on Twitter or the Evolution 101 podcast, which of course is still out there, um, yeah. I will put links down in the description. So before we close, if there's anyone who comes across this interview who's looking at this right now and who's very skeptical about the reality or resistant to the reality of evolution, I should say, what would you say to them right now? Well, usually what I say is don't listen to me (laughs) because the, 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 the tendency for them to trust an admitted atheist, an evolutionist, 
whatever I might be, is very low. Don't listen to me. Listen to Francis Collins. Go get his book, The Language of God. Read it. Uh, also get um, uh, Ken Miller's book, Finding Darwin's God. I recommend that all the time to believers. He, he is a, he's, a, he's a believer. He's a Catholic. He goes through all the evidences in a very systematic and, and understandable way. He's a brilliant writer. Um, and he also uh, makes a pretty reasonable case for a role for God in, in the whole process. So uh, there is no reason at all why uh, Christianity or any other sort of religious belief necessarily um, has to be at odds with evolution. It's merely the, um, well, quite frankly, it's, it's merely the, the fundamental, fundamentalist cultural elements in America particularly. Creationism is, as a historical uh, phenomenon is a reaction against all this stuff. And then for years, Christians had no problems with, uh, with incorporating science into their lives and understanding it as being, uh, basically understanding better the mind of God, you know, which is basically what Francis Collins, uh, what his approach has been. Uh, but in this country, fundamentalists hijacked that process in the early part of the 20th century and regressed back and, and sort of retreated back from that in a very uh, anti-intellectual and quite frankly, harmful way. And it's not at all part of the Christian heritage uh, to do that. It is, it is a recent development, and it is not something necessary to be a Christian and to be a creationist. And of course, there's nothing to stop anyone from going out there and doing the scientific work themselves. I mean, fossils are there to dig up, for instance. I mean, anyone could do that. It's all out there. Go, so, you know, look, if you want to go to Ken Ham's museum, go to Ken Ham's museum, that's fine. But go to other museums, too. You know, go to your local natural science museum, natural history museum, um, and, and talk to the people there. Um, you, you know, see for yourself. Look at the fossils. Look at the, look at the molecular evidences. Um, and just, just learn a little bit more about it. And I, I, if you still, you know, are skeptical about evolution at that, at that point, that's fine. Look, you know, I'm not exactly an evangelical uh, person for evolution. I don't really, it doesn't matter to me personally whether or not you accept it, aside from the fact that I think everyone should, you know, accept science <laughs> because it helps us, right? But I'm, I'm not, it's not some goal for me to convert you to a certain point of view. I just want everybody to appreciate the science. Dr. Zachary Moore, thank you very much indeed. Absolutely. Cheers.